All right, so welcome to this tutorial, take number two, because the first time we recorded it, everything got lost, but hopefully this one will be even better. So welcome. Um, I am going to be using this um, uh, demo to talk about color because a lot of you guys asked if I could talk about that. And um, just a precursor, this is what I finished on the iPad, and I actually brought it into Photoshop afterwards to just make some final touches. So you can see the top is the iPad first pass, and the bottom is the uh, finished product after I brought it into Photoshop. So if you toggle back and forth, you can just see that I really just, it's really just, um, really minor touches that I think really make a big difference in my opinion. Um, so yeah, now I'm gonna be going into the actual, you can see my whole process of how I built it up on, um, painted it on my iPad on Infinite Painter. And also another precursor, um, you will see I really struggled with this painting and it looks decept deceptively easy because, um, I mean, there's not so much going on, you know, there's not like a, a whole war scene or something, um, but it's, hard for me and it was hard for me because of the the value change in this piece is not very drastic there's not a lot of contrast in terms of light and dark because it's an overcast piece and when that's overcast piece you don't get a lot of you know different lighting variation and you see everything mostly in its local color and because there's also that misty effect in the clouds it kind of you know puts everything really simplifies everything into really similar mount, uh, value range. So that's why this piece was really hard. It was really hard for me to get the edge control that I wanted in the clouds and also to get the shape language that I liked in the mountains and the clouds and the bushes in the front. So yeah, you'll get to see me, you know, struggle and um, figure things out along the way. But what is that, you know, that always happens in a painting and that is when you learn the most. So I'm actually really thankful for when that this kind of situation happens. So you're maybe asking, why did I choose this piece to talk about color? Well, I think that on the contrary, you know, a lot of people think, oh, like a beautiful piece, you know, you need vibrant colors and poppy colors, you know, whatever subjectively is a poppy color to you. Bright reds, bright yellows, happy colors, that's all subjective. But you can also infuse so much color in a more let's say more dulled down or more monochromatic painting where there's more neutral grays and more warm and cool grays um, than really vibrant color. So a lot of people think, you know, you need really beautiful color to whatever beautiful may you, you to be, you know, lush greens, you know, all that nice stuff to make a beautiful painting, but that's not always the case. So the first thing I want to talk about um, before I talk about color is um, value. And a lot of people tend to overskip this, but a value of a color is equally as important and sometimes even more important than exactly what color you're putting down. And that is the first thing that um, I consider. Um, I don't necessarily, necessarily do a lot of value studies or I don't start off doing a value study for this, but in my head, I'm constantly thinking, about value. Okay, how light or dark is that color? Is it too light? Is it too dark? Before I'm even thinking about, oh, is that color looking good? Is it pretty? I'm thinking simply about how light or dark that color is and if it makes sense in the scope of a painting. A lot of times in a painting, 90% of a problem with the painting has to do with value. It's value related and it's not color. Um, so when you're struggling with the painting, ask yourself first, is that color the right value? Meaning, is it the right darkness or is it the right lightness? And if it's not, it's better to fix that first and then go into the next step of, okay, is it the right color? Is it the right temperature? Is it the right hue? And I'll be going uh, into all that after. So with this piece right now, you can see right now, I'm still trying to establish my value structure uh, more over color. My colors are nowhere close to how I want them. Um, and I am trying to figure out, you know, how how dark I want the clouds. I'm trying to figure out kind of shape language too, but that will be finesse later as well. Um, but right now, I'm just taking the lasso grunge tool. And I can already say right now, my mountain is too dark and it's too saturated. Um, so value-wise, it's a little bit, and maybe it's a little bit too saturated in color. 
I need to darken my bushes in the foreground. Right now the value of that color is too light. And of course I'm just blocking the shape. So you can see I'm lightening up the mountain just a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit too light now. And um, of course the clouds, the light side of the clouds need to be lightened up as well. So right now I'm thinking like that. Um, and I'm not really so much thinking, oh, is that shape pleasing? Is this shape? I'm kind of just slapping down shapes and getting a, getting a conglomeration of, um, of of values that sing well together and that tie the piece in together before I start really nitpicking more in color. So all in all, I'm trying to say that you cannot isolate color from value. A lot of times, um, people tend to separate that. Um, and you know you can do value studies first to practice that and as you get better you train yourself to simultaneously think about both at the same time because what's the point if you put down a color and it's too dark or too light it's just gonna destroy your whole painting and then there at that point it doesn't even matter how pretty your color is how vibrant it is how you know whatever whatever you want if it's the wrong value it's gonna stand out like a sore thumb it's going to basically ruin your painting like I said earlier, 90% of the problems with a painting are value related. So that is what I'm trying to stress in this first point. Um, value and color are linked. And first and foremost, make sure the value of your color is right. So if I'm squinting at my reference picture right now, still quickly talking about value, I'm squinting it, and even though my reference picture is not in black and white, I can see that on the right side where the foliage is, the dried up yellow foliage, it's a different hue per se, um, but it's about the same value as the purple areas in the mountain, in the main mountain, in the main hill in the back. The road is also of similar value, maybe just a little bit lighter. And of course, the darkest part of the image is the bushes in the front. Um, and of course, the peak holes in the sky, that blue peak hole, as I'm painting now, or I was painting, is a little bit lighter than the underside of the cloud where you get those nice baby blues. And of course, as you swipe to the left side of the clouds, it's lighter. But even in those light areas, there's slight variations of darker, slightly darker areas, slight, slight, slight. And of course, the lightest, the lightest areas. And the lightest area is where the clouds are. So I'm going to make sure that my clouds have the lightest value. But I'm doing this just by squinting. And I cannot, ex I cannot, um, stress the importance of squinting at anything, whether you're painting plein air, uh, digital, even if I'm painting digital, I'm squinting at my screen, even if I have it, the image really small. And a lot of times I'll paint my image very small. I don't zoom up a lot because when I zoom up, I get caught in detail and I get caught in areas that when I zoom out, I'm like, oh, that I just added way too much miscellaneous detail that I didn't need. So squinting is of utmost importance. Now you're probably asking, all right, I think I got value pretty good down. I understand that, but how do I, how do I choose colors? How do I know, you know, um, a lot of times people, you know, ask, how did you mix that color? Well, first and foremost, there's a lot of ways you can um, mix a certain color. And I, when I'm mixing a color, especially t traditionally, because I actually am mixing my colors, <clears throat> I'm thinking of, um, you know, how warm or cool I want it. So I'm thinking about color temperature. But before I get into that, I want to talk about, um, you know, what, uh, how to choose a color. And I want you to ask yourself, not so much how to choose a color, but how to place two or more colors together to create a pleasing harmony. For example, if you're trying to make a statement in your painting by putting a dash of red, a red by itself is, you know, beautiful, but to accentuate it even more, why not put its complement of a more desaturated green, desaturated so that it doesn't compete with the red. So um, I really think in terms of complements, a color needs to have a complement to exist. For example, a green field will not have any vitality if there's no red in it. And going back to mixing, that is how, um, when I mix colors, I think about that too. So when I'm mixing, that is how I think. Uh, for example, in gouache, to make a purple, I'll make sky blue and a lizard and crimson. And let's say I want to you know, make a, a desaturated version of that. 
well, I, mo I won't mix black, you know, that would just dull it down. I mix its complement, a yellow ochre, a lot, and that would get it more desaturated, but also warmer, because yellow ochre is a warmer yellow to me. So for example, with this painting, um, the hill in the back, I want to play with complements in terms of the light and dark part of the hill. So for the light part, I want to pick, um, you know, a reddish yellow that's um, lighter, obviously, but a little bit cooler. And for the um, grooves par groove parts of the hill, I want to pick a purple that is more desaturated but warmer. So now I'm starting to talk about um, temperature, how warm or cool a color is, and that is the next thing I'm going to talk about. But a lot of people think, you know, just because, let's say, oh, I have to, I'm picking a more desaturated color, therefore, um, it has to be cool. A desaturated color can be warmer than its counterpart. You can have, you know, desaturated, um, uh, warmer green next to a really bright, cool red. And that juxtaposition will really make the red pop if that is what your desire is. Um, so there's lots of different elements you can think about. It's not just, oh, a darker color is more desaturated. A darker color can also be more saturated than its lighter counterpart that is lighter and more vibrant, but, or sorry, lighter, but also more desaturated. And likewise, um, a more desaturated color doesn't always have to be cool. You know, you can play with temperature that way. It can be warmer, it can be cooler. So in this painting, at this stage that I am, um, I will say that right now, the purple in my mountains is a little bit too saturated. Uh, I need it to be a little bit more desaturated, but still, you know, keep that warmness. And I need to lighten up the light part of the mountain. Um, I think also my sky is a little bit too saturated, and I can infuse some more neutral grays in there to really balance out those bl blues that I have. So segueing into that, before I talk about color temperature, I want to talk about the power of grays. Um, in James Gurney's book, color and light, he says that grays are the spaghetti sauce of a pasta. And I really like that analogy because you can have the delicious carbs of all this beautiful color. You know, who doesn't like carbs? I love bread and carbs. But, um, you know, what is it without the butter, without the sauce, without, you know, whatever you're having it with? And grays is really what makes a painting sing, believe it or not. If you have a painting where you're painting something that is naturally vibrant, naturally um, you know, you have, you know, like an aspen landscape, you know, with all these fall colors. You know, if a painting is just having all those bright colors, the viewer is just being popped with all this color and there's nothing to balance it out. And those grays will do that thing. It will just ease out the painting a little bit. It will give you something to rest your eye on and also accentuate those colors, those pops of color that you want. For example, there's not, there's no such thing also as a warm uh, sorry, as one kind of gray, you know, like, um, I'm never, I never have black on my palette, first of all, when I'm traditionally painting, I never use black in digital painting, and, um, I'm not mixing my gray from white and black, I'm mixing my gray constantly from complements, so therefore I can get an infinite number of grays from, a uh, warm gray, so cool grays, for example, like I said before, if I wanted to mix a warmer, purple gray, you know, and a more, a gray in the more of a hue of the, pur a hue of the purple range, then I would desaturate it by mixing its complement, a little bit of yellow ochre. If I had a blue shadow, but I wanted to warm it up a little bit, I would take ultramarine and mix it with a little bit of burnt sienna to balance it out, because burnt sienna kind of feels like an orange. So I'm always mixing in terms of that, and grays are your best friend. Um, uh, that is one of really the most important takeaways, I think, that one can remember when painting a piece. And they go, mm, okay, my value's okay, but how can I make this painting just take it to the next level of ump? Think about neutralizing, think about, think about you know, what grays you can infuse here and there to accentuate other parts of your painting. They're working together, right? An artist that comes to mind when I talk about this is Edward Siegel. And he's one of my all-time favorite artists. If you haven't heard of him, you should look him up. But one of his paintings I remember seeing on Facebook, and that was when I didn't know him, and I someone posted it, and I went, wow, who painted this? It's amazing. And so I looked him up, and this painting, you know, by standard viewer means, it's, it's it, you know, 
to me, it's very beautiful. But to a standard viewer, it's it might be boring. It's really just um, an overcast, more monochromatic painting of a scene in London, I think, someplace in Europe, maybe Paris or London, I can't remember. But it's really just composed of grays. But like I said before, not one kind of gray. He has warm grays, he has cool grays, he has grays more on the green hue, on the purple hue, and all these working together creates such a beautiful painting of wonderful atmosphere and and you can just feel that overcast mist in this kind of painting, in this painting of the, these docks and these buildings in the back and and the edge control and everything is fantastic. Um, but just it, it just blew my mind how he just, there really is no pop of color anywhere, but because it's the, the grays are just singing against each other, the warms and the cools and the color temperatures, he so smartly puts them together in a way that really draws the viewer in. Um, that painting still sticks to my mind even to this day. Which leads me to segue into my third point. So I talked about value. I talked about color relationships and how to pair color together. Not so much about putting one singular color down and it, it looks pretty. It's about how you put colors together that really makes a, a difference in a painting. And I talked about um, grays, having neutral grays, having warm and cool grays. So actually, I talked about three points, I'm sorry. So my first, fourth point is I want to talk and touch upon color temperature and color temperature shifts. And this is something that I have really come to um, understand more and act more upon when I'm traditionally painting. But it came years of practice. It came after years of practice of you know first getting down value, and then when I you know touched them on color, I I realized that it's not so much also what color you put down, but how warm or cool that color is, and that will make just a big difference in a painting, even just a slight temperature change. For example, when I'm painting a traditional painting and I go, all right, that area is too dark. Let me lighten it up. And I go, okay, let's say it's a shadow. So I lighten up that area up and I go, okay, lighten it up. So it's the right value now, but now the, the temperature feels wrong. It feels too cool. So now I need to warm up that area a little bit. So I would, you know, mix this compliment. I would, you know, mix a little bit of whatever, a, a warmer color to, to, to warm it up a little bit. And that is what I mean about slight temperature shifts. It doesn't have to be drastic, but just a little bit will make a big difference. For example, um, right now in this painting, in those bushes, you know, again, it's overcast lighting, so you're not going to get a lot of contrast in light and dark. But in those bushes in the foreground, I have a sort of olive green on the top. Um, and then in the shadow of the bushes, it's a more desaturated, but it's a more warm, warm green and it's very subtle um, but what I can do to achieve that effect is in traditional painting I would mix a little bit of alizarin crimson with viridian for example just a little bit not too much if I mix too much it'll just become really really warm and it won't make sense in the scope of this painting but um, digitally I would take a new layer I would turn it maybe opac opacitate it a little bit and then I would just kind of put in marks of um, a darker, more desaturated red, just to lay it on top of that green. And so the slight temperature shifts um, can really make a big difference instead of just putting a lighter green and then a darker green. Think about its complement again. You know, instead of putting um, a darker green, I'm actually infusing hints of red, but it's more, it's a little, a little darker and very much more desaturated. Desaturated and warmer, a little bit warmer. So um, that is how I think in terms of temperature shifts. Um, I'm trying to think of another example. Uh, for example, in the mountain in the back, the main mountain, I can have pops of uh, slightly warmer purple, and then I can cool it down just a little bit. In some areas, I can have a cooler purple, a cooler purple compared to the warmer purple next to it. So I'm always thinking, is it cooler or warmer to the color next to it? Does it make sense value-wise? And does it work in the entire scope of the painting? So I'm always asking myself these questions. I'm always comparing the color next to it. So as you can see for this painting, even though there's not a lot of crazy color going on, I'm still thinking about value first and foremost, and color relationships, how I'm pairing them. 
and how to slightly shift to color temperature in, in areas, not too crazy because obviously it's not, there's not a lot of crazy things going on in this painting, but um, all those little things is really what's gonna make a painting be, all right, cool, that's good, to wow, all these little nuances are really making the painting For example, sing. in the road, I don't just have one hue. It's not just, um, you know, a, uh, a blue or a green, you know, whatever color concrete you think it may be. But I have, you know, I started off with a little bit of a, a warmer red hue, you know, more really desaturated, so it almost looks like a gray compared to the green next to it in the bushes. And then it sort of segues into a more bluish hue, um, but of equal, um, almost equal value. Maybe I, sh I should make it a little bit lighter, but um, those kind of subtle hue changes is, is what makes a difference instead of just having the road one color, one gray, and that's it. John Carlson once said, good color in a picture has infinite variations. And I really love that because for me, what that means is when I look at a painting and close up, you just see all this, these crazy, crazy brush strokes, all this conglomeration of color. But when you stand afar, the whole piece seems to come together. Um, you know, like it makes sense value-wise, lighting-wise, it's beautiful. But close up, it's almost abstract. And I love that because that's something that photographs can't do. You know, you cannot... The photograph just captures how it is, but you cannot have fun with all those color and shape variations as you can in a painting. And I think an excellent example of that is Nikolai Fetchin. Again, if you haven't heard of him, you should look him up. But I recently saw one of his paintings at the San Diego Museum of Art at Balboa Park. And it was a painting of Tory Pines, which is where I live close by. And so I was like, oh, I, I recognize that. It's a beautiful place. And it was this painting of these cliffs. Um, you know, very simple, you know, not a crazy composition, but I looked up close to the painting and in the areas of shadow in the rock. He didn't just have, you know, light side, light yellow, dark side, let's say, you know, darker yellow or brown. It was, he literally had, you know, purples, and warmer purples, cooler purples, and sometimes he had flicks of blue and flicks of this green to indicate maybe some, you know, moss growing in. And it was so, so much color, but all that color was in similar values that when you stepped back, it all came together. The color harmony and the value harmony all made sense together. And to me, that is what infinite variations mean. You know, um, you know it's, it's in the detail where all the excitement happens in the close-ups and far away, you know, no matter how chaotic the brush strokes may be up close, far away, everything comes together. And that is so cool to me. So you may be thinking, you know, this all kind of makes sense to me, but how do I know where to put it, you know, when, and, you know, um, just how? And, you know, that, there's no easy answer to that. There's no, there's no, like, you know, one straight shoot answer, like, oh, this is the formula, and that's how you always know. It just simply comes with practice, practice, reiteration, reiteration. And as you do that, your sensitivities will develop. And you soon realize that the painting will tell you what to do. It'll, you just naturally have an intuitive sense. So you should let the painting, you know, guide you. That's how I feel like I, when I'm painting a lot, you know, di digitally or traditionally, um, I will look at something and I will be able to tell if something is right or wrong. As soon as I put that mark down, I go, oh, okay, that doesn't feel right. Got to erase it. Sometimes not right away. Sometimes I have to, you know, do a lot of versions, di you know, digitally. And then I look through my layers and I go, okay, now I realize that some former strokes um, I liked her better. Traditionally painting, you know, there's no control Z. I don't, I don't get to work in layers. It's all one canvas. So I have to paint, step back, really assess and go, you know what, make the decision, make the decision that doesn't work or that works. Let's leave it there. But you really, um, you will really develop your sensitivities as you keep practicing and the painting will really guide you. And that is really exciting when you get to that point. So now I'm looking at my painting and I'm thinking, all right, it's starting to get to a stage where I'm liking it. There's a, for the longest time before I was experimenting with you know, all these brushes in the middle and I just couldn't get it to how I wanted to. Not to say that the brushes are bad, the brushes are excellent, I just couldn't use it. 
uh, I couldn't get it to work for what for this particular painting and I kept smudging and smudging but then I felt like the sky was too smudged and that is something about edge control too you know where to have a hard edge and where to have a soft edge and it's especially important for this painting because we have this misty atmosphere and obviously that's going to soften some edges so where to choose to have those crisper edges and softer edges is also what makes a painting sing um, and I will touch upon that a bit later when I show you the final version um, but for now um, I went back to the lasso tool and I'm just kind of having fun with these little geometric shapes in the sky which seems funny because the sky seems very puffy and very soft but I actually kind of like some of those harder edges I have and in the final version I'm going to smudge it a little bit so that it doesn't compete with the harder edges down on the land below but for now you know um, for the stage that I'm, I'm at I'm liking how it looks like and you can see also I added more variations in the sky. Before it was just kind of one kind of blue. Now I have more, some more desaturated blues, some cooler blues next to the other blues. So they look more desaturated compared to the blue next to them. You know, I have some slight more greener blues in the sky in some areas, some more purple, and some more purple, purpler blues. So all these variations of warmer, cooler, desaturated, less desaturated, light and dark. All those combos um, in just one area of the painting. Um, as you can see, I'm also adding some lighter areas um, in, in the bushes, you know, maybe adding some more yellow, uh, slightly yellow, yellow tone, toggling back and forth just to see. I'm still not sure about my shape language for the bush, so I'm going to be working on that a little bit. But for the most part, I'm liking, I'm starting to like how things are being pieced together. I like how the road sort of merges into the hill in the back and there's no definite edge there. Um, might not be exactly like that in the reference picture, but that is, you know, we can take liberties like that as an artist. You don't have to stick exactly to your reference as an artist. You can choose when to push or pull things if it all makes sense in the story and the overall um, message or, you know, your piece is trying to convey. Um, you know, don't just do that for no reason. You know, it has to make sense within the scope of the larger painting, larger scope of the painting. So besides color, I want to take this time to talk about edge control. Um, and that is something that um, a lot of paintings can tend to miss. And for me, what a painting when I look at a painting like wow that is amazing and obviously they're masters so they have you know value down and their colors are beautiful and their temperature shifts and just the use of color is great and the next thing I observe is edges I think Richard Schmidt is really good at that um you know when to let some edges artistically go and when to keep edges you know nice and crisp and so for this painting in particular, um, like I said before, I'm trying, um, I want to keep the bushes in the foreground a little bit more crisp, not only because they're in the foreground mainly, but I also want to juxtapose that with those softer edges of the clouds that are the mist that is coming over the mountains and that sort of blends the mountains in, recedes them in the distance. So I want to play with that a little bit. And also, like I mentioned earlier, you know, right now everything is pretty geometric because um, I use the lasso tool a lot. But later on, um, I want to figure out how I can soften up the sky a little bit so that the sky and that um, the area of the bay, which I think is my the, the light area where all that mist is coming in, in the middle, basically, of my painting, bottom middle, that's where my focal point is, I think. The road's leading up to it, the mountain points to it. So I want to have um, areas of complexity there. Um, compared to the rest of the painting. So you'll see that in my final, I try to enhance that even more. And a lot of times, um, sometimes you'll see paintings with, you know, the edges are all too soft, or everything is too crisp, and it just looks too realistic. Um, for me, a good balance of soft and hard edges um, is what really makes a painting come alive. So with this painting, how I'm trying to um, play with some edges is one, by um, creating shapes that are of similar values. So for example, in the hill and the mountain in the far back, the cliff, 
it's if you squint, it's pretty similar value to the sky. So I'm sort of making these shapes of color that are similar in value to sort of soften up that edge. Another tactic is, of course, using the palette knife tool on Infinite Painter, and I'm just smudging it just a little bit, um, just to soften up the edge. And how I would paint, and how I would do that traditionally, is by taking my brush, putting it in a little bit of water, and then just taking taking my brush and just quickly swiping over the area that I want the edge softened. And that will usually do the trick. And then you can, of course, go back in and work it up a little bit more if you want. So it's this constant pushing and pulling, you know, softening and carving, carving and blending. Um, that is what really painting is. It's this constant sort of tug of war, this sort of, um, um, yeah, push and pull. And even though there's not a lot of movement going on in this painting, you know, there's not people running or, you know, um, nothing's falling down. You, know, you can still convey energy within the direction of the brush stroke. So I'm really trying to capture this energy in the clouds, you know, um, having this force that leads your eye around the painting as well. So here is the iPad sketch as it was finished. And then after, afterwards, I took it into Photoshop and I turned it into this. So the difference isn't huge, but I think it's really those subtle, minute tweaks that really bring the painting, I think, to the level that I wanted and that I'm finally happy with. So you can see that I actually used just the marquee tool, and what I did was I just created little squares of shapes here and there to add to the impression of complexity. I wouldn't say my painting is by any means super detailed, you know, I'm not rendering out anything in particular. It's really just shapes of value and shapes of color that create this piece. But what um, I did in Photoshop that I'll, is that I added some little crisp areas of shapes um, where my focal point is, where those distant cliffs are and the light area of the water is along with the cloud. And if you squint, that is kind of where my eye is drawn to because there's, there's more complexity there compared to the right side where there's the mountain. I, I, I tried to tone down the complexity there. And also the bushes have some nice textural quality too, so that adds to the focal point area. And the clouds, like I said before, I had a few more shapes, but I ended up softening it just a little bit um, so that it doesn't compete with the more textural complexity um, on the bottom. So um, I also toned down my main mountain a little bit. The purple, I think, was a little bit more saturated. I made it a little bit more desaturated um, in this piece. And you can see also in the foreground where the ground is, um, I have some greens, you know, um, different variations of greens, warmer greens and cooler greens. I also have some, some hints of pink and purple in some areas. It's very subtle, but if you look closely, you can see. And since they kind of work as complements, it really just, um, I think, makes the painting come to life a little bit more than instead of using just another flat green for the ground, one green for the ground, and then another green for the bush. You know, I have subtle hue variations and subtle temperature variations just when that one area of the painting. So, yeah, I think that is about it. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I hope it wasn't too overwhelming with color. Um, again, it may seem, um, you know, a lot to take in, but it, it just comes with practice and looking at each piece and just pushing yourself a little bit more, experimenting and pushing yourself. It's okay to put a wrong stroke, then you know that it doesn't work. It's okay to, you know, make mistakes because that's how you learn. I made plenty of mistakes and I look back at them and go, okay, this is what I can do better next time. I'll remember that for next time to not repeat that. Or, oh wow, I found this really awesome um, temperature shift that I, I found works really well in shadows and I can use it in another piece. Um, you know, for example, I like mixing, you know, my sh in, in gouache, I like mixing you know, a lot of times sky blue with a little bit of lizard crimson and a little bit of yellow ochre. And I love using that for shadows and rocks. I think it does simultaneous, simultaneous warms and cools in just one stroke. So things like that, it just comes with practice, keep going, keep working at it, and I guarantee you can only go up from here. So I hope you enjoyed that, and if you want to look at my other tutorials, feel free to go on my Gumroad, Tiffany Mang Art, 
You can also check out my Instagram at Tiffany Mang Art. And if you have any questions, please email me at tiffanymangart at gmail.com. It's all Tiffany Mang Art to make it easy. And you can check out all my other tutorials. Um, if you use the code PAINT, you can get them all for free. Thank you so much for watching this, and I hope you have a great day. Stay tuned for more videos, and see you later. Bye.